Well, we're going to be one more week before we get back to Ephesians, folks. I hope that's not too disappointing. But I, from time to time, when we come to the end of a year and about to begin a new one, I, I think it's always good to do some spiritual inspection. And so the title of my message this morning, and I'll have you turn to 2 Corinthians 13, begin with verse 5. We're going to read down through verse 10. And if you would please stand as we read this portion of Scripture. But is... Uh, to examine ourselves spiritually. And we're going to talk about the cause and the consequences and the cure for spiritual decline. But 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test. But we pray to God that you may do not do wrong, nor that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. For this reason I write these things while I'm away from you that when I come I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. May God bless his written word. You may be seated. It's always amazing to me uh, God's timing and how appropriately Brother Elijah's Sunday school lesson fit in with what I'm speaking on today. And so one of the things that I think it's good for all of us to do from time to time is to examine ourselves spiritually. And that's all, the you know, you get to the end of the year and the start of a new year and everybody's talking about entering into another year. And, and I think that it's good for believers to step back and examine themselves or to judge his or herself biblically. By the way, I could not help, I don't know how many of you noticed on that last song, All Glory Be to Christ. Uh, when I listened to the rendition of that, it was, I thought, well, that tune sounds very familiar. I don't know how many of you knew, that's the tune to Old Lang Syne. That millions of people will be singing tonight, but they won't be singing about All Glory Be to Christ. So, if you want to sing something at midnight tonight, if you're still awake, sing All Glory Be to Christ. But the reason that we evaluate ourselves by what the scriptures say is certainly because when we just judge ourselves or we judge ourselves in comparison to others, well, we end up looking pretty good. It's sort of like when we get dressed in the morning or we get dressed to come to church, you know, us guys, and we look in the mirror and everything looks okay. Then we walk out and our wives say, you need to change that shirt. You need to wear a different tie. Something along those lines. We need evaluation. We need health evaluations, but we need spiritual evaluations even more so. And so what we want to be judged by, what we need to be judged by as Christians is by the standard of the scriptures, by the standards of God's word to know, am I doing okay spiritually? Have I lost sight over the last year, so to speak, perhaps, of where I am? Am I better off now? Have I grown spiritually? Am I walking in a more holy manner out in the world? Is my speech more becoming? Is my interaction with others more a testimony of Christ now than it was at the first of the year? Or are there some things in my life that I need to repent of? That I need to look at seriously in my walk with Christ? Now there's a lot of scriptures that talk about examination or judgment. You know, and we live in an age where people don't want to be judged. Oh, and the one verse that seems that people out in the world know will be, judge not lest you be judged. Even though they take that out of context because it's talking there about hypocritical judgment. It is good for us as believers, number one, to examine ourselves, to judge ourselves spiritually by the scriptures. 
And it's also, in a sense, when we do that, we are being judged by God himself. We need to compare ourselves with what he says in the scriptures. Now, the first scripture that I just read this morning in 2 Corinthians 13 and 5 tells us there to examine ourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Now you say, well, are you trying to cast doubt upon me, trying to cast doubt upon my salvation? No, I'm trying to get you to make sure that you are saved. To look and see what the Bible has to say, what a believer looks like. Because so much of the world in this day and time that we live in, in this age of easy Christianity and easy believism, says basically all that it takes to be a Christian is you just repeat a prayer or you go through an ordinance of baptism or you're just a member of the church and that makes you a Christian and you don't really have to examine yourselves ever as far as your walk, as far as whether what is being seen in your life or your obedience is validating the fact of your Christianity. And this is really what Paul is talking about here. And if you get to the end of that section of scripture there, he says, I, I don't want to use my authority there uh, for tearing down, but I want to use my authority for building up. And so hopefully in your examining of yourselves, scripturally, you will come to the conclusion, yes, I am a child of God. But we examine ourselves in that realm. Secondly, we should examine ourselves for the purpose, really, of humility. If you would, for a moment, and this is going to be somewhat of an exercise today in uh, Scripture, uh, and looking at Scripture, in Galatians chapter 6. And there in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will have to bear his own load. Have you ever met someone that really thought that they were something spiritually? Well, it is when we begin to think in ourselves, and we were talking about this morning in regards to sanctification, that you get sometimes people, they don't think they need to progress any farther in sanctification or in their knowledge of the scriptures, of those kind of things. They go, oh, I, I am I'm reached the zenith of spirit, my spiritual walk with God and my knowledge of the scriptures. Well, if you think so, then Paul had this word here. He said, you think you're something, but you're really nothing. And so we examine ourselves for the purpose of, really, I think, our humility, for the purpose of humility. Thirdly, there's another way, and if you want to now, you can turn over to Philippians chapter 1 in which we examine ourselves. In chapter 1 of Philippians, and there in verses 9 through 11, the Apostle Paul writes there, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve, or what that word really means, examine or judge what is excellent. And so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. And this goes right along with what we talked about in Jude this morning. To examine ourselves for the purpose of sanctification, practical sanctification, growing in the knowledge of Christ and the increase of spiritual fruit in our lives. And that was such a beautiful illustration that Elijah gave this morning, and I, I wish I'd have thought of that, about the fruit. Why did God talk about, when he's talking about growth, why does he talk about fruit? Because it's very slow. It happens slowly, but then it becomes evident in the lives of God's people. And so what Paul is talking about there is examining ourselves so that we might grow in sanctification and in spiritual fruitfulness and usefulness. And then, if you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we read this particular section of scripture quite frequently because we observe the Lord's Supper here in the church uh, the first Sunday of every month. But over there in chapter 11, verses 28 through 31, the Apostle Paul is here instructing the Corinthian church there about examining themselves before partaking of the Lord's Supper. So what does he say there? Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. 
That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So what Paul is talking about there is when we come to the Lord's table, are we examining ourselves? Are we giving serious consideration to our walk with the Lord? But also, are we giving con serious consideration to what the Lord's Supper speaks of? And that is then that the perfect, sinless Son of God died so that we might have eternal life and right standing with God. And so we examine ourselves in that regard. And so... This is why we examine ourselves. This is what Paul is talking about. And one of the reasons that I, I really wanted to bring this out, I think too often in our cultures, I've said before, we live in people that want it to be non-judgmental about everything, but particularly the modern church, people have excused far too often for people that call themselves Christian and yet have no evidence of Christianity. They say, well, they're just backslidden. Now we're going to get to that passage of scripture over in Proverbs 14 and 14 that talks about, uses that phrase over there. But the reality is that, that if you are in that state or if I am in that state, then there needs to be some serious spiritual examination of ourselves. Each of us and all of us need to examine ourselves frequently in the light of God's word. And let me say this, pastors and elders and teachers need to do that just as much or maybe even more so than those in the pew or in the flock, so to speak. So first of all, we're going to talk about the cause of spiritual decline or as some would use the term backsliding. Where and how does spiritual decline begin? And it's really difficult. You can't really often point it to any one thing for generally, it's not something that happens with a single event, but happens over time and is generally rooted basically in some disobedience to the scriptures, some command of God's word. Now think about David, King David. And we all know the story of David and Bathsheba and how David's great fall there and what it resulted from. And, and I'll, I'll turn to these and read these for you. But in 2 Samuel, and there... In chapter 11, and there in verses 1 and 2, it says, In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab. He said, well, that doesn't sound so bad. He sent out his general, his commander. Well, listen on. And his servants with them in all Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It was commanded. It was, David was supposed to be out in the field with the army. But instead, he stayed at home. And it happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. And then we know later on that she returned to her house and the woman conceived and she sent and told David, I'm pregnant. So David's disobedience and being where he should have been as a king did not really just start with that one event. It wasn't like that David was being obedient to the Lord and walking in the ways of the Lord and then suddenly all of a sudden he fell into adultery and then as we know the story, into murder. It happened over a gradual period of time is what happened in that. But we see what happened there. People minimize to say, well, this is just a little sin. But let me tell you something. Little sins, if you keep repeating them, lead to big sins, quote, unquote, as if there is a difference in God's eyes. And they lead to consequences. And we'll talk more about that later. But here we see it led to him not being out in the field with his army like he should have been, led to him being in the palace which led to him be looking upon Bathsheba, which led to him coveting another man's wife, which led to adultery, which led to murder, which led to a fractured family. His household was never the same. It had effects. And we see Solomon, his son. And then if you go over to 2 Kings chapter, or 1 Kings, excuse me, chapter 11. 
And there it talks about, there about David, I mean, about Solomon falling in to sin. And he was a man, we know he was a man of great wisdom. But in some ways he fell from that wisdom and did not follow his own wisdom as you read it in the book of Proverbs. But in chapter 11 there, and really in the first 12 verses, I'm not going to read all of that, but some significant portions here, Solomon loved many foreign women. Well, was that in a line with the command of God? No. God had command then them not to love foreign women, but to, to love only those of the Israelites, to marry only those of the Israelites. But he loved many foreign women, along with the daughter of Pharaoh. And again, many foreign women, that also goes against the command of God for one man and one woman. And any time that you disobey the commandment of God, there's going to be problems. There's going to be consequences in that. And so over time, what it says there, from these nations concerning which the Lord had said to the people of Israel, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. And it says Solomon clung to these in love. And so eventually what happened is that Solomon began to build temples of worship for these foreign gods. And he turned away from God. And God eventually, what the consequence of that was, is that the kingdom became split between the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom of Israel. There was a split. And so there again, we see this gradual falling into sin. What happens there? Then we look over in the New Testament. You remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira. Remember in chapter 4, things were wonderfully going on in the church. Everybody, many, were selling their goods and giving it to all that had need within the church body. Along Ananias and Sapphira come. Just two people within that church of all the work that God was doing. But they decided we're going to sell this for a certain price but we're going to keep back some of it. And that would have been okay. But they didn't say that. They basically said, we sold this for this price and we're giving everything that we made off of that sale to the cause of Christ and the church. They lied about it. What happened to them, the consequences were, is that they both died. That didn't happen overnight. That happened over time in that. And then we see it also, you talk about Demas over in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10 who was one that traveled with Paul, that was a companion of Paul. But eventually when you get to the last letter that Paul has written in 2 Timothy 4 and 10 it says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Now did that just, he wake up, was he faithful to God, and obedient to the word of God and then just one day forsake the Lord? No. It happened gradually over time, this spiritual decline. And we see it corporately also. We see in the, if you know about the seven letters uh, to the churches of Asia Minor in Revelation 2 through 4, that two of those received commendations, but five churches, Ephesus was reproved for their lovelessness, Pergamos was reproved for their doctrinal compromise. Thyatira was reproved for their tolerance of sexual immorality. Sardis was reproved for its lifelessness. Laodicea for its lukewarmness. Did that come in just a moment in time or did it happen over a period of time? Well, it happened over a period of time. And see, that's where we get fooled sometimes. We take steps backward. We don't see them as steps backward. But we take steps backward spiritually in obedience to the Lord. And then we begin to decline. And then we wake up one day and we're far away from the Lord and we wonder, how did we get here? So what causes spiritual decline? Backsliding in the life of a professing believer. There's several things, but I'm going to give just five. Number one, a lack of are consistent partaking of God's word in our lives. If you neglect the word of God in your life, you will backslide. You will become spiritually cold. 
Now, many people think that it's okay. As long as I get a good dose of preaching and teaching on Sunday, that's all that I need. Well, I tell you what, let's try this. Why don't you just try eating one day out of the week and just going without the rest of the week? How do you think you'll do? You won't do well. It'll be bad for you. So it is in Psalm 1 verses 1 through 3, David wrote, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. How does he not do that? But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither, and all that he does he prospers. How do we stay right spiritually? By staying in this book daily. Not just for the pastor teachers, but for the husbands and fathers for the wives and mamas and you young Christians you need to stay in God's word daily you need to stay in the word of God and one of the, and, and by the way I will give an admonition to the fathers and the husbands as we're the ones that are heads over our family we should be leading in that we should be reading the word of God with our families, with our wives, with our children, so that we can stay on the right path before God, do everything that we can to prevent spiritual coldness in the lives of those that are our family. So there, the neglect of the Word of God brings that about. Number two, a thing that can bring about spiritual coldness is prayerlessness. We touched on that this morning. Maybe I should have just had Elijah just teach this morning from the pulpit and, and because he, taught, he hit a lot of my points. Prayerlessness in the believer's life. Psalm 86 and 3, Be gracious to me, O Lord, for to you do I cry all the day. In Psalm 88 and 9, every day I call upon you, Lord, I spread out my hands to you. And in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, we all know this one, pray without ceasing. So when we neglect prayer, when we neglect prayer in our private lives, when we neglect prayer in our corporate lives as a church, spiritual decline is going to come, spiritual coldness. It is when it, it is not just important as we've already heard this morning about knowing the doctrine of God's word, but we stay near to God. We grow in, I would say, spiritual apprehension of the things of God when we come near to the throne of God. And his spirit teaches us and draws us near to him. But when we are prayerless, it will cause spiritual coldness. And decline. Thirdly, unconcern about and lack of attendance to the house of God. To the house of God. We all probably know this scripture from over in Hebrews chapter 10. And there in verses 23 through 25, where he writes there, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who Promised is faithful. How do we hold fast this confession of our hope? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. You know, it's a, it's a, people say, well, that, it would be great if there was an organization where we could do that. Guess what? You're sitting in it this morning. It is when, as he says here in verse 25, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. We come together. We stir up one another to these love and good works and do not neglect to meet together. Let me say this. Number one, coming to God's house, regularly being among the saints, will stir you up spiritually, it will encourage you spiritually, but on the other hand, when I see people start neglecting the house of God, that lets me know that they have backslidden, that they have grown cold and declined spiritually in that. 
David again over in Psalm 122 and verse 1 said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Preachers ought not to have to beg people to come to church. If you're a believer, you ought to be, well, I wouldn't want to say that, beating the doors down to come in. Well, well, we'll unlock them for you. You don't have to beat them down. But you see, this is one of the ways in which that prevents growing spiritually cold. But well, unfortunately, what we do is we live in a culture that thinks occasional attendance to God's house is fine. Uh, there, none of you younger ones are going to understand this. The only ones in here probably understand this phrase. There used to be a, used to be a hair product called Brill Cream. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. A few of you would know that. But, and their, their advertising phrase was, a little dab will do you. You know what? A lot of people are like that about church and about exposure to the things of God. A little dab will do me. It'll make me feel good about my week. It'll give me that little boost that I need. But that's not true. We need all of the fellowship with God's people that we can get to keep us spiritually vibrant and growing. Neglect of the Lord's Supper is another one, number four. We've already read that passage of scripture there. When we neglect, when someone neglects the Lord's Supper, they neglect the Lord's table and do not, as we've already said, examine themselves at the Lord's table. Consider what Christ has done for us, then we can grow and will grow spiritually cold. These are all means by which God has said, I've given you all of this so that you can continue to grow spiritually, that you might grow in sanctification like we talked about earlier. And then number five, maybe some of you don't think about this. But one of the things that can cause you to grow spiritually cold is close associations with those that are not saved and ungodly. Now I'm not saying that you can't have friends that are unbelievers. But our closest friendship should not be with people that are unbelievers. You say, well that sounds very judgmental. But I will say this. The world is not going to pull you more toward Christ. The world is going to pull you away from Christ. It's sort of like this thing that I've heard in the past that we've talked about before, mentioned and joked about is missionary dating. Young people don't do that. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. But if our friendships in this world are with those that are not Christ-minded, that are not believers in Jesus Christ, it is going to cause us to grow colder spiritually. And the, the scriptures actually tell us that we should not do that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, and there in verses 14 through 18, Paul says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? What fellowship has light with darkness? We are to have our close friendships with believers in Christ who will encourage us in our walk with Christ. So we've talked about here the cause here and the symptoms of spiritual coldness. What about here the symptoms and consequences of spiritual decline? This is not a benign matter, by the way. Benign mean harmless. We need to understand that God is not complacent about or concerning spiritual decline or backsliding. Do you think that God just looks upon us when we are declining spiritually, when we are pulling away from Him or growing cold in our, to the commands of His Word, in our relationship with Him? No. He is going to, He notices those things. That would be like saying that God is complacent about sin. He would, he's not holy, but he is not complacent about sin. He is not complacent about this decline in us spiritually. First of all, what are the symptoms of an individual or a church that is spiritually declined? So two different things that I've noticed, and I've done this for a little while. By the way, I don't know if any of you, some of you others might know. that In February, it'll be my 30th year here at Faith Baptist Church. And 
There's a lot of you in here that are not even 30. You weren't even born yet <laughs> when I started pastoring this church. But a couple of things. Number one, spiritual complacency and indifference to the things of God and their spiritual condition and lack of concern about spiritual growth. I have heard people say before, I'm okay with where I am spiritually. I don't have a desire to grow any more in my knowledge of Christ or in the things of God. Now that's a problem. Either somebody that says that is very far away from God or they are not a believer. If you have no concern about your knowledge of Christ and your growth spiritually, that is a serious spiritual problem on one hand or the other. And what I'm afraid we've done in our current culture is that we've decided instead we don't want to say people, oh, we don't want people to worry. And so we tell them that they're saved when perhaps they really aren't sometimes. Even though they have no spiritual fruit in their lives, they don't ever darken the doors of God's church. They don't ever read God's word. They don't ever pray. But somehow we've still evaluated because, as we've said, we live in an age where they pray to prayer or something like that, and so therefore they can be, have assurance of salvation. In Isaiah 64 and 7, he writes, There is no one who calls upon your name who rouses himself to take hold of you. For you have hidden your face from us and have made us melt in the hand of our iniquities. Do you ever rouse yourself up to read the word of God, to seek God's face, to be in God's house? Is that desire in your heart, in your life? Or is it as much of a desire now or more so than it was a year ago? The natural progression of growth. I see these children in here. Guess what? They're not going to look the same a year from now. Lord willing, if I'm still here to see them, they're going to be different. I look around at some that have been here. This is the same way spiritually. When we look at each other's lives as believers and when God sees us, what he wants to see is we were here spiritually this year and then a year later we ought to be up here somewhat. And there are different growth spurts in the Christian life. But you understand what I am saying here. Spiritual complacency is in polar opposite with what God desires for us spiritually. Number two, selfishness or a me first mentality in the mind or practically in the life where it's obvious that there is a seeking not first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness, but a seeking for my kingdom and my things. In Proverbs 14 and 14 that I've already referenced, he wrote there, the backslider in heart will have his fill of his own ways. The backslider in heart has a desire for what I want first. And then if I have time to fit in the things of God, then I'll do that. And we see that very often in culture. And in fact, it's typified. There is a passage, and I think Brother Wayne and I had a conversation about this not long ago, over in the book of Haggai. And there in verses, in chapter 1 and verses beginning with verse 3, he says there, he's talking about the nation of Israel, but it applies even in our day. Then the word of the Lord came by the hand of Haggai the prophet. Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house, speaking of God's house, lies in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. In other words, if you're spending more time about building your own house and updating your own house and my house is lying in ruins, something's wrong with this picture. He says, consider your ways. You have sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourself, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages does, does so to put them into a bag with holes. What's he saying there? God's saying there, you can do all of that if you want to, but if you're my family, if you're my people, and you're doing all this, and you're building your kingdom, guess what? And you think you're getting ahead with the things that you want and desire. Guess what? You're putting that bag that I'm holding, and there's holes in the bottom of it, and it's coming out. You won't get ahead. 
And then he goes on to say, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. We all need to consider. Are we, as believers, being self-motivated? Are we being worldly-minded? Or are we being kingdom of God-minded in our lives? He says, go up to the hills, bring wood and build a house that I may take pleasure in it and I may be glorified says the Lord for you looked for much and behold it came to little and when you brought it home I blew it away why declares the Lord of hosts because of my house that lies in ruin while each of you busies himself with his own house that's a pretty plain passage of scripture don't you think we need to be more concerned about the things of God about the kingdom of God than the kingdom of self or this world in this so as we get to this, let us be clear, then we also want to see here that there are consequences for this spiritual decline. We've already seen that God disciplines and corrects. We've already seen it in the life of David. We saw it in the life of what happened with Solomon there. In Hebrews 12 and 5, the scripture says, those that I love, I chasten. In Revelation 3 and 19, he basically says the thing, same thing. Now sometimes the consequences of our disobedience to God and to the word of God are its own punishment. Is it not? We see it practically worked out in the lives of those who rebel against God. If you're disobedient to the, to the, the, the word of God, if you, if you practice drunkenness, if you pray, and there will be a lot of that going on tonight, by the way, unfortunately. There's going to be consequences to that. A lot of people not only are going to get behind the wheel of a car probably and the consequences will be that their lives will be taken because they have defied the commandments of God and perhaps that somebody else will suffer because of that. Sexual immorality, we see it all the time. The consequences of all the diseases that come because of that. There are natural consequences that come sometimes. In Jeremiah 2 and 19, your evil will chastise you, your apostasy will reprove you. See, know and see that it is evil and bitter for you to forsake the Lord your God. I say, Brother Weber, you're kind of being heavy this morning. I do that because I love you. I don't want to see you come to an evil and a bitter consequence. I want to see you be obedient to the Lord and experience the spiritual blessings that come through obedience to God, following the Lord. And so oftentimes I've heard people saying, I've heard this statement and it chills my bones about people saying, well, I have chosen to sin, but I know God loves me and he will forgive me for it. Now just stop and think about that about presuming upon the grace and forgiveness of God. That is a dangerous place to go. That's a dangerous place to go, to presume upon that. And let me say this, we can, certainly we have all in this room chosen to sin, knowing that when we did it, it was choosing sin. But let me say this, we, th we don't get to choose the consequences. If you are a child of God, guess who gets to choose the consequences? God chooses the consequences. God chooses the consequences. And if you are truly his child and you do that because he loves you, he will chasten you. There will be consequences for that. So what are the spiritual consequences to the believer? Loss of joy. If you are declining spiritually, more and more you're losing the joy of your salvation. David said that in Psalm 51 and 12. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, your salvation, Lord. We lose joy when we're walking away from the Lord. Loss of peace and contentment. 1 Timothy 6 and 6, godliness with contentment is great gain, but when we are backsliding away when we are growing cold, declining spiritually. There is a loss of that peace and that contentment. Loss of communion with God. You ever heard the saying, well, if you don't feel close to God, guess who moved? God didn't move. If you don't feel close to God, you moved. 
or I moved. And I've had periods of time in my life, trust me, when I have drifted away from God. God disciplined me. Hard <laughs> in that. Loss of spiritual power. Sin in our daily lives, a drifting away with, from God will cause us to lose spiritual power in our lives. I thought about the, the, the example of Samson, who eventually his disobedience caught up to him. His hair got caught off, cut off. He lost his power with God, but eventually he, he repented and God restored his power for one final act. Loss of our testimony. Hmm. Loss of our testimony. I think about Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah. When God said, when the angel said, you need to get your loved ones out of here, Lot, and because we're fixing it, God's fit, about to destroy this city. And he tried to tell his son in laws, you need to get out of here because God's about to destroy it. They laughed at him. Why did they laugh at him? Because his life looked basically just like the others in that town. He had lost his testimony. Our light is to shine before men. But if we get far enough away from God, we lose our testimony. Loss of ability to worship. You ever come to God's house and try to worship and it's like, I can't worship. I don't feel the nearness of God. Again, it is because of sin in our life. Unanswered prayer. Proverbs 15 and 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. The farther you go in a state of spiritual decline, the harder it is to get back to the Lord. Just don't think that, oh, I'll just be able one day to flip a switch. And God will say, hey, that's okay, come on back. No. Very often, as I said, we get to a place and we wonder, how did I get so far from God? And then what is the, quickly, the cure for spiritual decline? Be assured of this, and this is the assuring part of the message. No matter how far you have backslidden, no matter how far you have spiritually declined, do not ever feel like you can never repent and once again have a right relationship with God. Satan would try to tell you that. God doesn't want you back. You've gone too far. No. Psalm 51 proves that. David was restored. Now, he didn't get his consequences taken away, but he got back to a right relationship with the Lord. In Proverbs 14 and 16, it says, For the righteous falls seven times and rises again. It is the Lord's desire for us to be in right fellowship with him. That's his desire. That's what he wants for you as a believer. 1 John 1 and 9, the reassurance that we have there, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is no sin, let me say this, there is no sin that God cannot forgive. There is no sin, praise God, that his blood will not cover. You know that song this morning. I'm telling you what, I just about got all happy this morning. All glory be to Christ. All glory be to Christ who shed his blood so that every single sin that I ever commit, he will cover. And when we stray from him, when we repent and confess that sin, he restores us to that right fellowship with him, to that near fellowship with him. Lamentation 3, 22 and 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Our sinfulness is ever before him, but when we truly repent, then he will forgive. Micah 7 and 18, who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity, passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights, listen to that, he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. 
He didn't say to those five churches in Asia Minor, I'm done with you. He said, no, repent. And there will be restoration. There will be forgiveness in that. But let me say this. Repentance involves more than just saying I'm sorry. It involves action. Remember the story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus, the wee little man. He was a great sinner. But when he repented, he didn't just say, well, Lord, just forgive me. But he said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. All that I have taken unlawfully or unrighteously, I'm going to give that back. And even more, there was an action in his repentance. I think about the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost. The apostle Peter said they cried out and he said repent and be baptized. And what you see in that is that they they repented, they were baptized. But beyond that if you see over there in Acts 2 and 42 that their lives were transformed. In the apostles doctrine and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. That's the evidence of Christianity. That's the evidence of of a vital church and vital Christians seeking the Lord. That know that they have received the forgiveness of the Lord. There's an action to that repentance. There's a move away from the world and toward God. And a desire for Him. Revelation 2 and 5, remember therefore from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works. Go back to the point that you can see this is where I fell. I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped praying. I stopped going to God's house like I should. Well then when you repent you know what you say? I'm going to start reading my Bible again. I'm going to start praying again. I'm going to start going and fellowshipping and being consistent in in attendance at God's house. Those things and the Lord's table. Go back to those things. That is what repentance looks like. And do those things once again. So, don't stay where you are if you realize that you've declined spiritually in this last year. If you've strayed from God if your commitment to his word and prayer and spiritual growth and commitment to his house and fellowship with the saints has declined in the last year, then what? Repent. Return to the first works and he will restore. The time to repent is not, well, I'll I'll think about that maybe next week because by next week, you know what? A lot of this message you're probably going to forget. Don't wait till then. Even today, make a commitment to get back to where you used to be and to say, by God's grace and by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm going to commit to growing in Christ and walking with Christ and being what I ought to be as a Christian, as a believer in Him. And I believe that He'll answer that type of repentance and that type of prayer. Begin the new year with renewed and vibrant love for the Lord Jesus Christ. May we pray.